responsible kitchen diplomacy, but will plan our further steps to restore Russian-U.S. relations based on the policies of the Trump administration. The Kremlin's decision comes a day after the FBI and Department of Homeland Security released a joint report detailing how federal investigators linked the Russians to hacking involving the Democratic Party. The 13-page report describing tools used by the Russians to, quote, compromise and exploit networks and endpoints associated with the U.S. election, as well as a range of U.S. government, political, and private sector entities. While the document provided little in the way of forensic proof to confirm the government attribution. It did lay the groundwork for Mr. Obama's response, but critics worried the diplomatic fallout could have major ramifications on America's standing in the world. The world looks at our country to have peaceful and a productive and a smooth transfer of power. This type of nonsense is what I would expect from a tin pot dictatorship that just became a democracy and can't make the democratic system work. It's America demands better. I think it's clear it cannot be business as usual, uh, that this was a serious attack against our country, against our democratic system. I think the president has taken uh, steps. I'm, we're still trying to evaluate it to see exactly what impact it will have on Russia. We could do more. Just how the Trump administration handles the Russians and the sanctions imposed by the Obama White House remains to be seen. But White House officials are warning against straying too far from convention. If the next administration wants to lift sanctions uh, against senior uh, Russian intelligence units to make it easier for them to interfere in our elections, you can go ahead and do that. We just don't think that makes much sense. And the PR battle continues even into tonight, Shannon, with Vladimir Putin saying it was regrettable that the Obama administration would end in this manner, but he nevertheless sends his New Year greetings to both the Obama and Trump families. Hmm. Shannon. All right, Kevin. Well, we also heard a bit of news on the domestic front today, apparently out of the White House. The president, it seems, has a meeting planned with House Democrats next week. What's that about? Well, there's a number of reasons that the House Democrats want to get together with the president. Most notably, they want to continue the conversation about sanctions. In addition to that, keep in mind, you've heard a great deal about Obamacare, the so-called repeal and replace movement. House Democrats are not going to let that go without a bit of a fight. And so they're going to get together with the president and discuss not just those two issues, but a number of other major issues as they look forward to life without the Democrat and the White House. Shannon? Big changes coming. All right, Kevin Cork in Hawaii. Thank you. And President Obama talking tough with Russia. But today, Donald Trump showed there could be a major shift in policy towards Russia just three weeks from now when he takes the oath of office. Correspondent Peter Ducey reports from Florida tonight about what could be a major reset with Russia in the new year. The current president is punishing Putin, but the next president is praising him, tweeting about the Russian leader's pledge not to retaliate against the U.S. until he sees how the Trump administration treats him, saying, quote, great move on delay by V. Putin. I always knew he was very smart. That public message to Putin came just hours after transition officials said the two had no plans to speak privately until the president received an intelligence briefing about Russian interference in the election, a briefing scheduled for next week. As to the question about whether or not the sanctions levied by the Obama administration will be here to stay once Mr. Trump takes over, the incoming White House Chief of Staff, Reince Priebus, says nothing is set in stone. That's going to be up to him, and he's going to sit down and talk to his leadership and at the Defense Department and state and in the White House and make those decisions, Eric. The transition team's wait-and-see attitude with Putin is a lot different than the current administration's feeling, but it fits with campaign trail talk from Mr. Trump. I would treat Vladimir Putin firmly, but there's nothing I can think of that I'd rather do than have Russia friendly. Prominent Republicans, including Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, Senator Lindsey Graham, and Senator John McCain are pleased the Russian government is facing some sort of consequence for cyber meddling, even though they think it's long overdue. But that sets up a potential intra-party split, because the head of the party, the soon-to-be sworn-in 45th president, said last night about all the talk of hacking, quote, it's time for our country to move on to bigger and better things. I agree with the president-elect that we need to get on with our lives without having uh, elections uh, being affected. 
by any outside influence, especially Vladimir Putin, who is a felon and a murderer. But despite Mr. Trump's past statements about Putin, experts expect him to keep an open mind when he has the authority to set his own Russia policy. This is going to be a part of a conversation that the president-elect sets with the congressional leadership. Um, I think they will give him the opportunity to establish the priority when it comes to uh, creating a much stronger and constructive bilateral relationship between the U.S. And, and Russia. And I do think they'll make their case for stronger sanctions. The incoming counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway, says it would be very unfortunate if the Obama White House is just punishing Russia to make it harder for the next president to shape his foreign policy, as some reports have suggested, because she says that is not the way peaceful transitions of power are supposed to work. Shannon? Yeah, we will talk with the panel about that potential theory. In the meantime, Peter, what does the president-elect have planned for New Year's Eve? Yeah, from Russia today to Rocky tomorrow, Sylvester Stallone is going to be one of the guests at Mar-a-Lago for the big 800-person New Year's Eve bash. So is Quincy Jones, the legendary music producer, and Fabio, who met with the president-elect earlier this afternoon and actually stopped by our live shot location to say hello as well. Said he had a nice meeting. Did you say Fabio? Maybe maybe it's a hair, a hair summit. All right, Peter Ducey, thank you very much. It is nearly as long as the Empire State Building is tall, and in 2014, it was the launch deck for the first airstrikes against ISIS. Soon, the USS George H.W. Bush will head back out to sea to face the enemy once again. Pentagon producer Lucas Tomlinson recently went on board the ship to see how the crew is preparing for the fight. On August 8, 2014, a pair of F-18s from USS George H.W. Bush launched the first airstrikes against ISIS in northern Iraq. Now, nearly two and a half years later, that same aircraft carrier is gearing up for a turn to the fight. After being delayed in the shipyard for six months, leaving America without an aircraft carrier in the region until early next year. Fox News recently traveled out to Bush 40 miles off the coast of North Carolina to see the warship's final tune-up before setting sail early next year. This is the military equivalent of spring training because our uh, once we complete this at the end of December, then we'll be going forward and it'll be it'll be real forces that will be uh, that will be going uh, flying with and against. Much has changed since Bush's last deployment to the Persian Gulf in 2014. Russia has deployed dozens of fighter jets and thousands of troops to Syria, joining Syrian and Iranian-backed forces. China has moved hundreds of missiles to the South China Sea. Officials say those missiles were deployed to China's seven man-made islands in early 2017, putting American aircraft at risk. The ship's commanding officer says his crew will be ready to deal with China or Russia if necessary. While we don't have any emergent or pending conflicts with them, certainly, uh, it is fair to say that we have divergent interests in many cases. And so we need to be prepared to understand uh, how will we will react to that if we're necessary. Here aboard the USS George H.W. Bush, there's about 80 jets aboard. Air wing sailors aboard are taking part in their final exam before taking off for the Persian Gulf and future strikes against ISIS. The U.S. military and its allies have conducted over 17,000 airstrikes against ISIS, but will have to do without the services of an aircraft carrier for now, after USS Eisenhower returned to Norfolk today, following a seven-month deployment to the Middle East. And while the focus of the U.S. military remains on ISIS... That doesn't mean three months or six months from now that that will be the priorities uh, for our country. So we have to be ready to execute anywhere, anytime, any mission. Aboard the ship, 18 to 22-year-old men and women are working 14 hours a day on the flight deck with very little rest. And all this is just training before deploying in the coming weeks. Shannon? Our thanks to them and their families. Lucas, thank you so much. A countrywide ceasefire that went into effect at midnight in Syria seems to be holding, despite some minor violations. Tonight, reporter Kitty Logan looks at what this could mean for a possible peace deal. On the front lines, opposition fighters watch and wait. These free Syria army rebels have welcomed the ceasefire, but the reality for them is that this war isn't likely to be over yet. We are committed to the ceasefire to keep civilian people safe, but we are here on the front line, ready in case the regime tries to break the ceasefire. The ceasefire is largely holding. Observers report a few minor violations near Idlib. 
and clashes just north of Damascus. It's reported the government carried out limited airstrikes in response there. Aid agencies are hoping a pause in the violence will mean a chance to move badly needed supplies. We hope that this ceasefire will finally allow unrestricted access to the civilians in the crossfire in the besieged areas. But not everywhere is calm. ISIS isn't included in the deal. In areas it controls, the fighting goes on. And the political passion which has stoked this conflict for so many years is still strong. In Idlib today, people again protested against President Assad, just as they've been doing since 2011. A peace plan involving Russia, Turkey and Iran will most likely allow Assad to stay in power, at least in the short term. It's something his opponents are unlikely to accept. I'd be personally rather sceptical if Assad will survive right the way through into the period when there is a united Syrian government. But the first test is to see if the new ceasefire holds. If it does, there are set to be further talks involving all key players in Kazakhstan. Russia is now asking the UN Security Council to adopt a resolution to formally recognize this ceasefire. That could happen on Saturday. Shannon? Kitty Logan, thank you so much. A North Carolina judge is temporarily blocking a Republican-backed law that limits the powers of the incoming Democratic governor. The judge ruled today that the risk of free elections warranted the block on the law that strips the governor-elect, Roy Cooper, of control over election boards. Cooper also filed a lawsuit over the law today, calling it unconstitutional. Well, the markets fell on the final day of trading in 2016. The Dow dropped 57. The S&P 500 was down 10. NASDAQ lost 49. But despite the last few days, the markets had a big year. The Dow rose more than 13 percent. S&P jumped 9.5. NASDAQ was up 7.5. If you've filled up your car lately, you've probably noticed higher gas prices, and it isn't just because of the busy holiday travel season. Fox Business correspondent Jeff Flock is in chilly Chicago tonight with what's driving up prices and whether the new year will bring us some relief. Good evening, Jeff. Shannon, good evening to you at that uh, mobile station back there behind me. And Americans all across the country saved $27 billion billion with a B dollars last year on gasoline compared to the previous year. It was $27 billion spent on other things to lift the economy, but the good times seem to be over, at least for now. Take a look at the numbers in the last month. Gas prices on average, U.S. up almost 8 percent. If you look this time compared to this time last year, we're up about 16 percent. We were at $2 for the national average last year at this time. We're about 232 today. It is a new reality, but it is a new reality that drivers seem resigned to. They're going to keep going up regardless. There's nothing we can do about it. We can complain as much as we want. as It's not going to make no difference. And this is something that we need regardless. So, Shannon, uh, not so good if you're pumping gas, but if you're pumping oil, maybe better news. Those who have invested in the oil patch or who work there, good news. Take a look at it. just a couple of companies that do business in the Bakken Shale and the Dakotas. Uh, a company like uh, uh, Halliburton or Whiting Petroleum, both of those up double digits over the course of the past three months. Their stock, that is. So good news there. Where do we go from here? Well, we talked to our friends at GasBuddy.com today who tell us they think 20 to 40 percent uh, or 40 cents more in the coming year in terms of a rise in gas prices. So not a dramatic increase, but a little bit of that dividend that we got this year, maybe not so much next year. Shannon. All right, Jeff Flock, thank you so much for updating us. The head of an agency supporters say is designed to protect you is under scrutiny for possible past transgressions. Republican lawmakers are looking into the leadership of Richard Cordray as they look for a possible opening to push him out of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But as chief political correspondent Carl Cameron reports, removing Cordray isn't going to be easy. President-elect Donald Trump and Republicans are planning big changes for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, created after the 2008 financial collapse to protect borrowers from predatory lending, arguing it has instead stifled growth with overzealous government regulation. This is an agency that is taking a very, a very wide stance on its power, really trying to expand its authority, and you have this one person at the head of it who's running all of it. President Obama, in his first term, named Richard Cordray director of the CFPB. 
Lee. Republicans want to dump him. A possible GOP replacement candidate is Texas GOP Congressman Randy Neugebauer, a staunch Cordray critic. But some Republicans want to replace the director position with a fairer, bipartisan governing commission. In more than 60 appearances before Congress, Cordray argued lending is growing, not slowing, and consumers are better off because of it. The mortgage market has been expanding briskly for two years now since our major rules took effect. The credit card market has greatly improved with strong consumer protections, better industry performance, and increasing customer satisfaction. Republicans have a diametrically opposing view. There is now growing concern that despite the Bureau's mission, its rules and regulations actually restrict access to credit, increase costs, and deny financial products to the consumers who need them. The GOP chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, Jeb Henserling of Texas, has drafted legislation to restructure the CFPB. Consumer advocates accuse the GOP of trying to court Wall Street by lifting regulations designed to protect Main Street. Lisa Gilbert works for Public Citizen, founded by Ralph Nader in the 70s. I expect ongoing attacks. A huge part of that is the huge power of Wall Street and the money they pour into the political system. Uh, there's a reason why uh, you know they don't want to be regulated. They want to have free reign, uh, but it's not a reason that's good for Main Street Americans. It's good for their bottom line. As part of his plan to make America great again, the president-elect has promised to improve everyone's bottom line. Doing it simultaneously for both lenders and borrowers is going to be a big part of next year's reform battles. Shannon? All right, Carl Cameron, thank you very much. Up next, horrific 2016 statistics for Chicago. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 10 in Phoenix, where residents had to steer clear for a while as three bulls got loose in a Glendale neighborhood. One of them, you can see they're even trying to tussle with a truck. The bulls roamed around free for about an hour until their owner was able to wrangle them back home. Fox 8 in Cleveland, where the search continues for a plane that disappeared over Lake Erie Thursday night. Airport officials say the three adults and three children on board the plane had just attended a Cleveland Cavaliers game. No word on what might have led to that disappearance. And this is a live look at New York from Fox 5 as all of the Big Apple is preparing for the biggest party in the nation. The ball is up. The countdown is set. And extra security will be on hand as an, uh, they expect 2 million revelers to get ready to ring in 2017 in Times Square. Fox News Channel, of course, will also be there. Our All-American New Year airs on Saturday night starting at 11 p.m. That is tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We will be right back. Chicago had more murders this year than New York and Los Angeles combined, as the city has some of its worst violence in nearly 20 years. And while murderers, murders are up, arrests are down. Senior correspondent Mike Tobin reports from Chicago tonight on the disturbing trend. With bloodshed at levels not seen in decades, Chicago police anticipate violence will increase this weekend when booze is poured over the endless cycle of gangland vendettas. This follows a bloody Christmas in which a dozen people were murdered. We now know that the majority of these shootings and homicides were targeted attacks by gangs against potential rival gang members and groups who were at holiday gatherings. As of Thursday, Chicago police reported 756 people were killed in the city, up 56 percent from 484 last year. 3,525 were shot, up 47 percent from 2,400 last year. Shooters and victims are predominantly black. Most targets are gang members. They shoot each other because they're on other teams. I would say probably 20 to 30 percent of our shootings we can tie to narcotics. With the heads of the big gangs in prison, the street gangs have splintered. One section of the gangster disciples will battle another. The dispute is often petty. Social media puts gasoline on the fire. Former Chicago Police Superintendent Gary McCarthy says following the outrage over police-involved shootings, policing has become politicized and cops are backing off. The problem is proactive policing, and not just here in Chicago, across the country, has come under fire. The uh, anti-police political environment that we're in has it that we're emboldening criminals and we're hamstringing police. Demonstrators intend to take to the streets against gun violence again this year. 756 crosses, each with the name of a 2016 murder victim, will be carried through Chicago's glitzy downtown shopping district. I'm hoping first that we will be shamed by it and say, oh my God, this can't happen anymore. But then we would be shaken to do something. 
Now, for causes, people point from everything from family structure to economic opportunity. But one thing in the short term is clear, that police are making fewer stops and they're less likely to get involved when something looks suspicious. Shannon? Mm. All right, Mike, thank you. Ambushes on police officers fueled a sharp increase in the number of officers killed in the line of duty this year. Since the beginning of the year, 135 officers have lost their lives. While some died in traffic accidents, nearly half were shot to death. Both Texas and Georgia lost seven officers to gun violence this year. For Texas, it came in one day with an ambush attack on officers in July. California lost six officers, Louisiana more four, including three from an ambush attack. And shootings led to the deaths of four officers in Michigan. Eight states have now legalized recreational marijuana, but despite easing the law over pot use, it's a growing new problem now for law enforcement. Correspondent Alicia Acuna has the report from Denver. When I see the Colorado Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman has a warning for states that recently legalized recreational marijuana. What we are seeing, unfortunately, is an influx of organized crime. In 2012, Colorado and Washington state were the first to legalize recreational pot. Since then, voters in other places have passed similar laws, bringing the total number of states with legal recreational marijuana to eight. Kaufman says one consequence is Colorado became the new source for smugglers. We aren't um, especially popular with our neighbors when it comes to sending marijuana and therefore crime into uh, into neighboring states. Nebraska and Oklahoma sued the Rocky Mountain state for not preventing the product from leaving, a case ultimately dismissed by the U.S. Supreme Court. According to a federal report by the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, the number of seizures of Colorado marijuana heading out of state skyrocketed from 58 in 2008 to 394 in 2015. And there is no sign of a slowdown. Professor David Shirk, an expert in the drug trade and border crime, says the pot coming out of Colorado is so prolific and far more potent than what's grown in Mexico. We've got a much higher product uh, available at a very low price in the United States, and so there, we're effectively uh, seeing legal pot producers put Mexican drug cartels out of the marijuana business. In a recent interview with Rolling Stone magazine, President Obama said while he is not advocating for a marijuana policy change, it is, quote, untenable over the long term for the Justice Department or the DEA to be enforcing a patchwork of laws or something that's legal in one state could get you a 20-year prison sentence in another. Where the incoming administration comes into the picture on legalized marijuana is somewhat unclear. On the campaign trail, President-elect Trump said he thought medicinal was okay, but not recreational. But he also supports states' rights. Shannon. All right, Alicia, thank you. 2016 was a big year for news, but some of the biggest headlines were not only about the stories, but also about the pictures captured along with them. Tonight, correspondent Abby Huntsman has a look back at the year in video that went viral. Surveillance video, dashboard cams, and cell phones catching some of the year's most dramatic, amusing, and downright bizarre moments on tape. Take a look at this. An officer stops to inspect a fallen tree limb and narrowly escapes being crushed by another giant branch, getting away with only bumps and bruises. Or how about this surveillance video from Georgia, where a convenience store clerk boldly took on an armed robber, fighting back by hitting him in the face with her hands and part of the cash register. In San Diego, another thief is caught on camera, but this guy wasn't even after money. Apparently, he needed a board or two to catch some surf. And it's not just criminals caught on tape. Take a look at these brave people creating a human chain to save the driver of a car engulfed in flames. Or these heroes in Alaska coming to the aid of a driver whose car flipped over and caught fire. Heroism wasn't in short supply this year either. Rescuers banding together again in El Hot City, Maryland, to reach a motorist whose car was quickly becoming submerged in flushing floodwaters. And this woman who was rescued from her sinking car in Louisiana, her dog trapped inside until moments later. I got you, oh. Her rescuer pulls him to the surface.
A lot of surprises in the land of surveillance and dash cam video this year. Check out this Georgia mom's reaction when she realizes that the cop who pulled her over has her military son waiting in the back. Good sniff and for some help getting past a fence. Animals can be a bit strange, like this hawk mesmerized by a weather cam in Lincoln, Nebraska. And who can forget this mom's video that went viral, getting a kick out of a Chewbacca mask she bought to surprise her kids. <laughs> That one racking up millions of views online. 2016 was quite a year for Caught on Camera, and as we all use technology more, what we capture on video will only get more interesting. In New York, Abby Huntsman, Fox News. All right, forget fireworks or that glittering ball in Times Square. We've got something out of this world to help you ring in the new year. NASA says a comet may be visible Saturday night near the moon. But if you miss it because you're too busy ringing in the new year, don't worry. You'll get another chance to see it in five years. Well, in just 24 hours, punishment and praise for Vladimir Putin. Coming up, the all-star panel weighs in on the battle between the incoming and outgoing administrations over how to handle Russia. Wild swings of the day. Massive government ramping sign. up the fight against ISIS. This is a monster it's storm. A fight over the balance of power. Horrifying attack could have been just getting started as this news is. There is an uprising. We have had a lot of news breaking. We'll stand up. We're not afraid. We consider these sanctions completely uh, unsubstantiated, uh, unreasonable and uh, very detrimental to the bilateral relations between two neighbors, between the United States of America and the Russian Federation. Uh, they are bitter because they have to leave uh, uh, before their uh, term expired. Uh, we, all what happened is they uh, have to leave I within uh, hours. And uh, it's, 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 it's just not, not human, frankly, not human. Reaction from a top Russian diplomat uh, on the sanctions that President Obama unveiled yesterday. So let's talk about it with our panel. Tom Rogan, columnist for National Review and Opportunity Lives. Leslie Marshall, syndicated talk radio host and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Welcome to all of you. Uh, and there were a lot of people who thought that President Putin would unleash something very nasty in return. But here's a bit of a statement today. He said, as it proceeds from international practice, Russia has reasons to respond in kind. Although we have the right to retaliate, we will not resort to irresponsible kitchen diplomacy, but will plan our further steps to restore Russian-U.S. relations based on the policies of the Trump administration. By the way, he went on to tweet, Donald Trump, great move on delay by the Putin. I always knew he was very smart, exclamation point, Tom. Mm. Yeah, look, I mean, the, the Russians, I actually thought they might uh, over-retaliate and get the U.S. ambassador out of Moscow. Uh, but I think what they're doing here is quite simple. They think they can manipulate Trump because he's playing right into that at the moment. They will keep playing this game uh, until there comes a pushback point, which they have not seen, frankly, under President Obama. And I think these expulsions represent that. Why didn't he persona non grata the ambassador if he wanted to show a really serious message? Um, I found it quite amusing, though, that that Russian uh, foreign ministry statement, the consul general, mm -hmm. that's Russian humor, nothing else. That's a, a sign of profanity to President Obama, of disinterest. They were tweeting out a photo of a duck. Mm -hmm. um, because duck. the, Rus the Russians mm -hmm. do, any American diplomats or Western diplomats in Moscow or journalists, uh, they do far worse, far more inhuman things than that, going into their apartments and leaving gifts of Special every measure. Packages. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm and read between the lines. Yeah, well, and I thought it was interesting too, Leslie, because the, the statement from President Putin went on to say, by the way, any diplomatic kids who are in Moscow right now, we invite you to the New Year's Eve party at the Kremlin. Um, so is some of this tongue in cheek? What, what is yeah. this? Yes, I, I think uh, definitely. I, if President Obama were in his first term going into second, or if Hillary Clinton were coming in as president next year, I don't think we would have seen the same reaction and response from Putin and from Russia as we are. I agree. Mm -hmm. I think he looks at, well, I've got my buddy, which Democrats call his puppet, uh, President-elect Trump coming in. So this is how I'm going to respond. I have to say, I think this is great that the president did this, but honestly, as a Democrat, I think he should 
should have done it a long time ago. You know, we, I, I was looking at history with Russia today, and I was looking at not only hacking but spying. We executed a man and a woman in this country for spying. So, I mean, this, uh, this is a serious offense. Even re when Republicans and Democrats agree on something, we know there's a level of seriousness and severity. And uh, I'm not surprised by Putin's response because, you know, next month it's a whole different ballgame for him. It, it is. And there are questions tonight about the timing of what the Obama administration has done. Kellyanne Conway, who's going to be a, a senior advisor to the president, has been campaign manager um, to President Trump. Here is a bit of what she had to say about why now. Even um, those who are sympathetic to President Obama on most issues are saying that part of the reason he did this today was to, quote, box in President-elect Trump. Uh, that would be very unfortunate if that were the motivate, if politics were the motivating factor here. But we can't help but think that that's often true. Um, even the New York Times characterized it as such that this may be an attempt to box him in to see what he'll do as president. That's not the way that peaceful transitions of administrations work in our great democracy. Charles, how much do you think what President Obama did is about Putin versus being about Trump? Well, I think it's both. It was a twofer for him, but I think it's become rather farcical. Putin is showing his complete contempt for Obama, the way he kind of laughs it off. He decides that this is so trivial he isn't even going to retaliate, which is the normal thing you do. I love the way he invites American diplomatic kids mm -hmm. to the Kremlin. I mean, what kid doesn't dream of a New Year's party at the Kremlin? What American kid doesn't? I mean, he's and he's uh, Trump. I think has sort of played into it, uh, and by congratulating Putin, but it's a smart to move on the part of the Russians. You put no pressure on Trump, so you give him the option to drop the sanctions. But this is a complete distraction. These sanctions are meaningless. The only ones that matter, and even those sanctions are not that severe, are the ones that were imposed on Russia because of Ukraine. The two leading candidates for the French presidency next year are both opposed to those sanctions. Those sanctions are on their last legs. And that's, if you're worried about sanctions and Russian aggression, that's where the focus ought to be. These are going to be temporary sanctions on Russia for a few weeks. Maybe Trump will keep them. But as soon as they're in ag agreement on anything, some kind of trivial uh, nuclear deal or something, the dropping of the sanctions will be a part of that, and this will be a distant memory. Well, and Tom, what kind of situation does this create for incoming President Trump with, as uh, Leslie noted, there is bipartisan support for taking more serious action against Russia for potential special select investigations into exactly what they did or didn't do with respect to the election. Um, and now he walks in with praise of Putin, with saying it's time to move on with our lives. And he's going to have opposition on the Hill from both parties. He's going to have opposition on the Hill, and it will create fraying, because there's real anger on the Hill. But there's also real anger in the intelligence mm -hmm. community, uh, and there's concern on the part of Western allies. And if, if you link back to some of the things uh, candidate Trump said about NATO, uh, the Europeans are especially concerned, and potentially the UK is sort of offering this pivot to Trump to say, look, we'll try and get NATO to increase defense spending. But if he keeps doing these sort of tweets, playing Putin's game, because that's what it is, it's, it's, it's standard you know, manipulation. And if he keeps ignoring the intelligence briefings, you know, the Russians think he's a joke as a fact. They think he's a joke and they think he's pliable. Uh, the, you're going to see degrading American credibility in the same vein, a sort of different version of President Obama's red line collapse, that American power is subject to the Kremlin uh, and more specifically subject to a uh, KGB counterintelligence guy who never left the KGB. Okay, so we have a late uh, tweet from the president-elect today also saying, Russians are playing CNN and NBC News for such fools, funny to watch, they don't have a clue. Then he goes on to add, Fox News totally gets it. So, Leslie, if they think that he is a foolish puppet, is he also playing the game back at them with some reverse psychology? What's going on here? No, I don't think that President-elect Trump is dumb, okay? Certainly he's made some very good business decisions uh, that have certainly bode well for him. Um, but I, I don't think he's as clever 
as Putin and his people in Russia, unfortunately. So no, I don't, I don't think in a sense he's bright enough to be, uh, you know, pulling that back, if you will. Um, I, I, I think it's terrible that uh, regardless of who won, that anybody isn't concerned about this. And I think one of the reasons the president waited is there wasn't enough information. And I think that as president-elect, Donald Trump should care more about this country because it's our election today. God forbid it's our nuclear codes tomorrow. All right, panel, that's it on this. But we've got a lot to cover in the Friday Lightning Round, including some of your New Year's resolutions. So stick around. The agreements that have been reached are, of course, fragile and need special attention and accompaniment for them to be preserved and developed. But nevertheless, it's a notable result of our joint work. I would like to express the hope that when Donald Trump's administration comes on duty, they would also be able to join these efforts. Uh, chatter there about the Syrian ceasefire. We're back with our panel. Charles, I'll start with you because it's notable that the U.S. had nothing to do with the talks that led to the ceasefire, but Russian officials are now talking about bringing Trump into the fold once he's sworn in. Continuing story of Russians showing their contempt for the Obama administration. We are not even invited to the talks that will be in Kazakhstan. In the past, when there was a dispute in the Middle East, the conferences were held in Washington or under the auspice of the U.S., we aren't even there. Look, the most important thing here is that this ceasefire, to the extent that it holds, is not a result of clever diplomacy. So what the Romans called the peace of the grave, the rebels were dealt such a huge defeat in Aleppo, they are in no position to carry on the fight in the same way as before. This is a Russian victory. The mantra out of this administration always was, you can't solve a civil war uh, militarily. The answer is you can. Well, Leslie, there are some notable terror factions that are not part of this ceasefire mm -hmm. as well. Yes, ISIS and Al-Qaeda are the Al-Qaeda branch in Syria. And uh, as you know, that's a part of the problem. I mean, if you look at the map of Syria, that's almost a third a part of the problem uh, geographically. And it plays into this almost six-year civil war, which has led to the millions of refugees that have left Syria. Um, look, we had 16 airstrikes that came from Assad's military today. I don't call that much of a ceasefire. And I'm not trying to be a pessimist, but even Putin just said that this is fragile at best. So I, I'm not, it, look, the United States says this is a move in the po a positive move in the right direction. I'm not sure how much of a positive move that is, because even though you have some Islamic organizations that are sitting at this table, uh, too, that caused a lot of uh, problems and murder among the Syrian people, um, are not there and are, are going to continue to wreak havoc in this region. Tom, how does the Trump administration address Syria? Well, they, they, we talk about credibility. They, this is um, on the, on the ceasefire is a joke. Um, it, it placed in Russia and Syria the way Russians bearing gifts because simply uh, the rebellion, if the moderate rebellion collapses, that force gravitates to Ba'at Fatah al-Sham, the Al-Qaeda syndicate and ISIS. It doesn't go away. The Russians know that. You know, how does it work with President Trump coming in? Well, he has two options, I think. He either pushes back against the Russians or he accepts it and gets it done. Um, and frankly, that's better than doing what we're doing now. The problem becomes for Trump, who's talking about credibility, if you acquiesce Syria, uh, the Sunni monarchies, which are traditional American allies, will gravitate towards funding Salafi extremists because they will never accept Assad and they will never accept the notion that it's Assad or ISIS. So th th it's this. Uh, it's going to get very messy, I think, very quickly. All right. I want to make sure that we get to economy, our next topic in this lightning round. Here's a bit of what Steve Moore had to say. Uh, he's been uh, an advisor, economic advisor, to the Trump campaign about why the markets have been uh, responding so well to his election. I think people are looking at the tax cuts that are coming. I think people are looking at the regulatory reforms, the probable growth energy policy, and they're saying this is going to be a president who takes growth and business seriously. And, and I think that's why you've seen, you know, this dramatic um, increase in, in the Dow Jones. And we could put up a look at uh, the Dow, how it's done this year and how it's done since the election. Quickly, uh, Tom, your thoughts on whether Trump can take credit for this or if it's just part of the natural cycle. I, I think partly he can. I think more that's about his this relative stability uh, that he's brought into office. But look, the, the fundamentals, regulation, I think, is a big thing. People are very, the business community is very excited about that, the reduction in regulation. 
but other things, uh, the pro productivity collapse, uh, the skills gap that we still have, uh, labor participation rates, those are things that are much more difficult, much more structural, uh, and things that, you know, I've brought 8,000 jobs back, that, that ain't enough. So mm -hmm. we, we shall see. The devil will be in the details. Leslie, a lot of work to do on Capitol Hill as far as addressing some of these economic issues that Tom pointed out. Uh, yeah, and I think also some, you know, some truth. Uh, the reality is that Donald Trump has thousands of jobs overseas, which he personally could bring to the United States if he closed his production plants in Mexico, in China, Bangladesh, India, as an example. Uh, President Obama has brought and created 9.3 million jobs. So when somebody is touting 8,000 jobs, which we haven't seen yet, and on December 6th, the Sohn company said 50,000 jobs, and now we're talking about 5,000 out of that 50,000. Uh, I, again, I just think these are tweets, and again, I have to see the creation to believe it. I, as an American, want our country to mm -hmm. succeed. I want jobs to you know, come back to the United States. But uh, the, the president-elect could do that right now with a phone call. Well, some pessimists had predicted a plunge of the markets. That's definitely not what we've seen so far. There appears to be some optimism. All right, we got to get through this. So, Charles, I want to start with your winners and losers for 2016. My loser, well, obviously it was Hillary, but that's uh, too obvious. I go with Chris Christie. He went for the brass ring. He not only didn't get it, uh, he not only was boxed out, he was humiliated. This is a very bad ending for a guy who uh, at one point was the only one who stepped over the line to embrace uh, Trump. The winner, of course, other than Trump, Vladimir Putin, Crimea in his p pocket, eastern Ukraine, sanctions are collapsing. Uh, we were supposed to have isolated him, he's isolated us, and now he's the king of the Middle East. That's a pretty good record for a guy who started out with a very weak hand. All right, Leslie, yours. Uh, my winner is, unfortunately, fake news. I mean, when you have Pizzagate trending and people actually believing that, uh, it's, it's a sad statement that fake news was winning over truth and real news. Uh, losers, uh, maybe those of us who you know, were subjects to believing the fake news, but pollsters, they had it wrong oh, across yeah. the board, every which way. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> is it tough year for them? Tom, yours? Yeah, my, uh, my winner is John McLaughlin, my mentor in the McLaughlin Group. Um, he started the show as a sort of rancorous shouting match but as it came to the end our ratings very interesting going through very strong tr quite a traditional set sort of more geriatric I was the younger element but <laughs> there was a great passion from across the political spectrum I think because we debated uh, and respect each other and that perhaps is something that uh, hopefully could be taken forwards. My losers are millennials. Millennials have a big problem because entitlement reform mm -hmm. is off the radar. That affects us very deeply in terms of prospective interest rate increases, and, uh, the, the net interest repayments on the debt. Um, but also another example would be Obamacare. Obamacare has dr dramatically driven up health care costs for young people. Uh, and because this is not on the agenda, uh, this deficit spending track, uh, then you know, what are we to think? I think the future is slightly bleak for us. All right, each of you has about five seconds to tell me about a New Year's resolution. Charles. I'm staying out of the candidate casino for two and a <laughs> half years. But because the vow doesn't take effect till midnight, I'll put 20 bucks on Cuomo in 2020. Ooh. You heard it here first, Leslie. Um, personally, uh, spend more time with my kids and be a better mom. Uh, and uh, as an American, hoping to work for unity. I would like some unity in this country. All right, yeah, I, I think that would be extension. I, uh, I would, well, I'd like to get the McLaughlin Group back going again. But I'd also like for an expansion of uh, good, polite, but firm debate in the country. That, that barroom mentality, which mm -hmm. I think is good. In, in the UK, you couldn't do that because people would fight. But here, there's, you know. Energy We've seen good. a few fights this year, but <laughs> we will all hope for unity. A lot of kumbaya in 2017. All right, that is it for the panel. Next up, the year in gaps, right here on Special Report. Rough business, and even when we try to tape things, sometimes that doesn't go well either. So throughout the year, we collected some of our outtakes from our own Brett Bear, and it better be just Brett Bear, for our annual blooper reel. Enjoy. The National Guard is boosting its presence in Flint, Michigan, as part of the... the you can see it right here on the website, along with reports by Carl Cameron, Ed and Hen... and Ed Henry... and... 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 That's a take. And a story by Amy Kellogg with startling... 
It's a long one. Blooper reel. Bleh. He's a reptilian a alien. Playground, something like that. He, 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 Meanwhile, officials in Istanbul, Turkey, identified the suicide bomber who killed 10 tourists this week as a ref. <sighs> This looks like this is going to take six years. <laughs> take six. <sighs> Registered refugee, say that. <clears throat> Scroll down a little bit. No other way. Sorry, up. We'll have all things politics tonight on the panel. There's no panel. So that's thumbs up. Join me for special report tonight at 60. Get covered. An update on the little sisters, sisters, little sisters, little sisters, little sisters. Mm -hmm. He's not even here to defend himself, but the truth is all of us who've been on TV for longer than five seconds, we all have our own bloopers of our own. So you won't be seeing those tonight. Anyway, thanks for inviting us into your home. That's it for the final special report of 2016. Good night from Washington. Tucker Carlson tonight with guest host Ed Henry.